Welcome to episode 18 of the Thelma Tapes, the Living Memory Association podcast. This edition is dedicated to memories of personal encounters with sporting heroes of the past. From Scottish boxing legend Ken Buchanan and footballers Laurie Riley and Alan Anderson to the local superstars of wrestling at the El Dorado. Back in time we go. We've got to show you that. Yeah, what's that, Jeff? That was my apprentice. Oh! Ken Buchanan. He was a world champion. Well, I, I remember Ken Buchanan. He was a hell of a fighter. He, he was my apprentice. But I've got one where he's, he's standing and he's got three belts. He's got the British champion, yeah. European champion and world champion. He's got holding up the three belts. Wow. I used to spar with him when it was lunch hour. I used to go down to the Sparta Club with me. He started at the Sparta Club as an amateur. Yes, because you were right into your boxing, weren't you? Yeah, I boxed in the army. And I... See, he had a hotel... A hotel down in the wasn't it the Bi- Ferry Vic- Road? That's it, Victoria Park. It was called, uh, wasn't it? That's uh, he, but it was called Kenny Buchanan's at that time. Ah, right. But what what happened there? He was he was always away on fates and whatnot, you know. Yeah. And his his staff just took a loan on him, you know. The, was he a nice chap? Yeah. Oh, he was a good lad. Yeah. You see, I, I I had him as my apprentice and starting. He was an amateur when I first had all of them, of course. But he started becoming a professional, you know, became a professional. See, what, after he won the world title, he, he bought that hotel. His father-in-law, like his wife's dad, he was a manager and he was good, you know, he right. looked after it. Mm. Anyway, the wife and then we parted, so it, it was just staff he had then, and of course he was always away. Eventually, he, he sold it, you know. The last okay. time, lifetime I seen him, I was in the, this is a good few years ago now, I was in the, the Chester Hotel, the Hot Chester pub and I was sitting at the, the seat and, and read, I was just uh, reading the paper and mm. just felt a tap on the shoulder here it was him <laughs> <laughs> so he, he brought a pint across that was the last time I seen him I was at his wedding and oh, yeah. I was at his wedding and I was at his party his bachelor's party oh yeah See when he was when he was starting out, it was a shame because there was we had a lot of apprentices before New Year's Day. You get hug money. The other apprentices used to go. They were like they'll do that. They finish up off what they clean up all the machines and everything, and then the boss let them all go out and have a drink. But Kenny couldn't go because he wasn't all he ever had was a I think it was a brown ale. But he was really dedicated, of course. Mm-hmm. So he used to come home with me. So. It was all well, right. My wife used to make a meal, and that kept him out of danger's way. Because Ken Buchanan, he had a couple of really hard fights. Didn't oh he? yeah, he fought South Ju- American guy, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, Roberto Duran. Well, Roberto Duran, to my mind, was one of the greatest fighters there ever was. You know, mm. Kenny was fouled. Yeah. You know, yeah. He, got, he went the thing, but he, he was fouled, and Roberto admitted it years later they become quite friendly actually. <laughs> but Roberto was one of the greatest boxers. Ever good. He was as hard as nails, and he fought in different weights, Did and he? became world champion each of them. You know, he was a terrific boxer, yeah. Duran, and he was fighting still when he was about forty-five. He was tough. You know, these people, these uh, South Americans, they're hungry. You know, mm. yeah. they want to get on. Well, I went along every New Year time to the uh, Hibs and Hearts match with my dad and my uncle. And that was a, a yearly thing, and. My best pal, we used to play football in Pitt Street and the police always checked us for doing it. We weren't allowed to do it. And he ended up playing for Hearts and his name was Alan Anderson. But we used to get chased out of the street and go out to where he stayed, which was just around the corner in Trafalgar Lane. I liked it better than really anyway because his mum always gave us a piece, a piece of jam. <laughs> <laughs> the, the police used to do the paper for chasing us. <laughs> Yeah, but he was just a, a schoolboy like me. Yeah, yeah. And we just played in the street. Yeah. But he went on to play for Hearts. God. And, well, the history group was down here the other, well, probably a while back there. And they tell me he, he still goes to some of their club things, but apparently he's in a wheelchair. Oh. And it's his wife that takes them. Good but Lord. But he's still alive. Wow, wow. And of course, down in, in Leith, they had the wrestling, didn't they? Did you ever get along the to wrestling that? wrestling was in uh, the El Dorado. I knew uh, McGurty, who owned the El Dorado. He was also a director of the state. McGurty asked me to rig a microphone up for him underneath the ring because he wanted everybody to hear the grunting and groaning. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I always thought it was a bit of a fiddle because how could you, you always had ordinary wrestlers and you had guest wrestlers. But if you were booked to do a wrestling, 
and you turned up to say, say we got to and you checked in to say I'm here. How could he tell you, go up to the cinema and come back here for quarter to nine? Yeah. How, how could he tell but how, how long a match was going to last? Yeah, yeah. That's, but, right. that's what he used to say to them. I mean, you go up to the cinema and they'd be back here for such and such a time. But did you not tell me they used to meet in a pub nearby? Was it you? My cousin's bar across the road. I right, right opposite it. Right. They used to go in there a lot. So do you, do you think they used to be in there deciding who would win? No, I never ever heard that. All oh, right. And do you remember any of the wrestlers' names when that were along there? Uh, George Kidd was down there. Mick McManus, Big Daddy was a guest one time. Oh, Giant Haystacks. I mean him. Um, I mind the one when I was in the army, Roger Bannister. He practised in uh, a sports field where we were at Caterham. But I didn't meet the man personally. No, no. But I just knew that that's where he practised. Good grief. That's where he ran. Oh, right. Goodness. Well, he was certainly a hero, wasn't he? Aye. Four minute mile and all that. Aye. But it was in Surrey, there was a training place there, and he just used to run around there. Do you ever remember ben Ken Buchanan? Because he had the. Uh, Oh, Ken, yeah. yeah. I knew Ken well. Yeah, because Ken used to, he loved Bairns. And when the Bairns were going to school, he used to invite them into the hotel when it was closed and let them see his belt. Because he kept tape the belt behind the, the bar. Mm -hmm. And didn't encourage Bairns in the bar, no? No, no. But if he was out in the garden or that and he saw them coming up the road, and they, they obviously knew him, Ken. Yeah, yeah. He said, why do you see my belt? And they'd take them in and show them the belt. Because yeah. he was he was very successful, wasn't he? Yeah, for a but short he, was, while. he was his own worst enemy because he, he ran the um, he hired the hall out for weddings and funerals and stuff like that. But if he knew you personally and you wanted to, to, like your daughter's wedding to have done there, yeah, you done it. He used to say, No, don't don't need to pay for it. Oh. So, and, and that was it, I think they, they, they took a bit of a line Yeah, off. what a shame. But he was uh, a nice chap to speak to. Oh, but uh, as it was own first enemy as far as yeah, money business. side went, mm. he was too generous, it was a matter of thing. It was the same at the Christmas and that. If you were having a drink and that, and you, you had the hall out and you got a meal, you paid for the meal, uh, he used to say, don't pay for the drinks, just the meal. Oh, for goodness sake. That kind of chap. Yeah, yeah. So were you a heart supporter then, Stan? Hibs. Hibs, right. Oh, Hibs. Okay. Oh, Depper Hibs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, d I don't know, but the typical policeman, I don't know how much it cost to get in, but he got in for nothing. This is your uncle, was it? Aye. Right. He, he just flashed his warning card and up. He was like, aye, come in, come in. Typical police, get everything for nothing. <laughs> but I liked it, because I made money out of that. Who, right. When they had their bottles in their pocket, their half bottles, and the chaps that they were drinking with used to say, here son, there's, there's sixpence for you, there's, there's money for you. And I got money for chips and oh. got the cinema and all that. Oh, that's all right, isn't it? That's a good earner. <laughs> Aye, so I quite enjoyed doing that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another trap I used to know, well, it was later in years, he used to play for him. He uh, had a pub, do you know not Pat Stanton? No, no, Elf, Elf Street he was in. I don't know, he was on But he used to say to me, N nowadays he says, they, they say, oh, a draw all day. Yeah. He said, no, on my day. He says, you were tell, you go out to win. He says, and they're overpaid now. He says, we didn't get money like that. I know, they get more in a week than they would have done in a year, oh, years ago, didn't they? I can't mean that traps, didn't they? Well, it'll come back to you, Stan. It'll come back, I because a, a pal of mine lived just up at all. In the mid-60s, wrestling had come to the television. And, of course, my granny used to look forward to this every Saturday afternoon, watching them, could name them all off, you know. We get ourselves quite involved, shall we say. Nobody liked to visit her on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> but they used to have wrestling at the El Dorado. And it wasn't my granny it would go. It would be if one of my uncles, especially, and his pal. So it was always, oh, well, we'll take the bearing. I can't mind. It was midweek it was usually on. You know, it was, it was a free-flowing 
you didn't just sit in your seat. I mind all these folk used to just walk about, you know, dance out of the road as they all came flying out of the stage and off the ring. The one guy I remember was George Kidd, and it was some, it was either a belt or a trophy that they were fighting for that time. I think it was a belt because I mind them with the belt on getting all the photographs and so on. He was, you know, whether it was like the Lonsdale belt or something like that, but he was very good. You know, an absolute terrific person to watch. So what age would you have been when you seen I this? You were the Bairn? Probably, this, well I'm yeah. saying the Bairn things. I would reckon I would have been 15. Oh right, yeah. Aye, 15 and, anyway. And what was it uh, that attracted you to the good-looking George Kidd? I just, Maureen? apart from the good looks, <laughs> in the trunks. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought he was, the rest of them it all seemed to be a bit of a pantomime with them, you know. Whereas this man yes. just, as little as I knew, looked quite skilled, you know. Right. He could um, almost turn on a tanner, you know, mm. and get them into the different holds, get out the holds just as well. And there was no muscle about him as such, you know, he was a very slim guy, nice fairy coloured hair, yeah. you know, uh-huh. that he was so completely different from giant haystacks yeah. and yeah. Jackie Palo. <laughs> and, and talking about men in trunks? Men in trunks. <laughs> Was there another? Yes. Did you have another? I was never a sports fan, but I liked swimming as well, but uh-huh. I think that was to do with the speedos. <laughs> <laughs> and the divers? Who was the diver that you liked? Well, it wasn't so much that I watched him uh, uh, yeah. as a diver, but my uncle Douglas was a, you know, fearful type of person. He, well, he had no fear, but his pal, when they were both young lads, was Peter Heatley, who then went on to be... Um, Olympic? Olympic. Yeah. Oh, I think Olympic. I, think I don't think it was just mm-hmm. Commonwealth. But they were brought up together, you know. But most of the time they were getting barred from um, Leith Victoria uh, swimming baths mm-hmm. because Leith Vickies, though they had a high dive and springboards, that just wasn't high enough. So... My uncle Douglas and him would go away up onto the balcony and come off the railings on the balcony. So usually by the time they surfaced out of the water, there was the attendant shouting, you're barred! (laughs) (laughs) Peter, uh, he then went on to start getting lessons and so on. And uh, ultimately became as good as as he did, yes. yes. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Whereas Uncle Douglas was still up on the, <laughs> the balcony. <laughs> what was the one about them jumping off, no, diving off a crane? Oh, that's... My Uncle Douglas used to work in the Dock Commission. Uh-huh. And he was the linesman, I think they were called, for Martin Bendix, uh-huh. who was the Leith Dock Commission diver. Oh, right. So he would go down and check the dock walls or... Um, you know, the lock gates yeah. and all this kind of thing. And what, he'd suit up for that, uh-huh. a real dive. And yeah. Douglas would feed him the line. Mm-hmm. But often or not, Douglas would end up just jumping in as well. You know, <laughs> there's Martin with all his gear yeah. going down and Douglas would swim down. <laughs> Next deal. <laughs> uh, to kind of give him a wee wave and come back up again. And it had been known that he used to go off the cranes. You know, if they were Actually on the dive docks, over, jump uh, off. Dive, dive. dive off the cranes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because they knew the depth of all the different docks at any one yeah. time when I'm working in it. Yeah. They often know it was the foreman saying, you'll be off without any pay. You know, you do that again. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Douglas, Douglas was That's terrible. Right. And he was like that all his life, mm. all his life. Mm. Yes, you just think, is it just opportunity that you could have... Yeah. Been a champion as good. as well. Yeah. Been as good, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it didn't open themselves up to that. <laughs> Fran Flocker, he was my cousin. He was my dad's mother's son. He was my cousin. My dad's name is James Flocker Stewart. They had a place up in Merkison called Ikoria Kos, and they had Jaguars. But at that time, when he was racing, the Jaguars was the top, top motor. He used to win nearly all the races. Mm. But eventually, he came out of that. 
We won a few races, and he went into aeroplanes. Right, good grief. And I don't know where he was, I think he was flying for, he was after a record, and he was flying from, uh, I think it was Australia, to New Zealand or New Guinea or somewhere, mm -hmm. and he disappeared, they come down the sea, never heard of him again. Good grief. That was Ron Flocker. Right, what was his name? Laurie Riley. <sighs> of course, <laughs> he was quite famous, wasn't he, Laurie oh, Riley? That's right, how could I forget his name? <laughs> but they used to see Bratley every week. Oh, for goodness yeah. sake. What was the name of his bar? I think it was just Rayleigh's. Really. That's what he called it, yeah. Thank you so much to Stan, Maureen and Jackie for sharing their fabulous memories with us. If you have a story to tell of days gone by, please pop in to see us at the Little Shop of Memory in Ocean Terminal Leith or at our new branch in West Lothian at the Centre, Livingston. You can also follow us on Twitter at Thelma Scotland, catch up on our regular events and workshops on Facebook or check out our amazing collection of videos and photos on our YouTube channel by searching for Living Memory Association. Until next time, on our Valentine's Day special, we bid you farewell.